Okay, so today um, we're diving into net zero buildings, right. which is a phrase we're hearing everywhere we turn these days, and and for good reason. If you're you know involved in real estate at all, or or, or worried about climate change, or honestly just wondering what all the hype is about, this deep dive is for you. We are digging into a recent article about this new standard yeah. that's um, being developed in the UK. And and it's uh, pretty interesting stuff. So so first things first, like why is everyone making such a big deal about net zero buildings? Well, you know, the, the built environment, mm -hmm. uh, the buildings we live in, work in, you know, hang out in, it actually accounts for a massive 40 percent of uh, global emissions. Ooh. Which is that's it's a, a huge three percent really. I would guess way less than it's a it's a big deal and and you know with the need to get those emissions down, uh, there's this global push to decarbonize construction. But the thing is, um, net zero can mean like a lot of different things to different people. Right. Yeah. So that's that's where this new standard is trying to come in, right? To kind of add some much needed clarity. Yeah, it's like it's like everyone's speaking like a slightly different language when it comes to to eco friendly buildings or green buildings, and it seems like this this new UK standard is is like, you know, the Rosetta Stone. Like it's it's trying to get everyone speaking like one universal language so we can all get on the same page. You know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's really about providing that that unified definition of of what net zero actually means. Like in practice, yeah. and, and this is important, right? Not just for for measuring progress, mm -hmm. uh, but comparing different projects, yeah. But also to kind of really drive those um, truly sustainable building practices, right? Right. So, okay, let's let's get into it. Let's unpack this UK net zero carbon building standard. What what are the big takeaways here? Well, this isn't just like some you know set of vague guidelines or anything. I mean, this is this is like firmly grounded in science. It's it's designed to actually align with the UK's carbon reduction targets yeah. and the Paris Agreement goal of limiting, um, you know, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So so it's the real deal. There's no there's no greenwashing allowed here. Absolutely. I like, agree with that. And it takes a really comprehensive view, too. It addresses both embodied and operational carbon. OK, yeah, yeah. Qu quick, quick break. What What's the difference between those again? Oh, good question. Yeah. So embodied carbon, that refers to all the emissions from, you know, the whole construction process. Yeah. So you're thinking, you know, manufacturing materials, transporting them to the site, um, the actual building phase itself. It all adds up. Okay. Operational carbon is, you know, that covers all the emissions from actually using the building. Right. So okay. heating, cooling, lighting, all that stuff. Gotcha. gotcha. Everything that keeps it running. So it's like looking at, like, the entire lifespan of a building from from, like, you know, I mean, I guess not not from like, you know, the, the creation of the materials, but right. from from construction to demolition. Yeah, pretty much. OK, cool. And, and it's important to note, you know, this standard, this applies to both new and existing buildings. Well, OK. Across a whole bunch of sectors, too. Interesting. You know, it's not just about some, you know, futuristic skyscraper or something. This is this is about making sustainability the norm, like across the board. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really curious to hear about the types of buildings that this uh, standard covers. Give me some examples. Sure. So you have your you know usual office buildings, residential buildings, of course. But we're also talking data centers, huh? which, as you know, use a ton of energy. Yeah. Sports facilities, even museums. Museums. Yeah. Wow. I, I never would have thought of that. Yeah. They're in there. Interesting. Interesting. That really shows how how serious they're taking this, that it's not just, you know, the obvious ones, but but they're really thinking about all these different um, sectors. Yeah. And, and here's here's where it gets, um, you know, really interesting. One of the core, I guess, tenets of this standard mm -hmm. is that it really emphasizes real in use data. OK, so so no more hypotheticals, okay. no more like wishful thinking. Yeah. If you're going to if you're going to say your building is net zero, you got to prove it. Yep. You know, you need to actually track your your real energy consumption right. and emissions, um, you know, for at least a year after it's been built or, or renovated. That makes a lot of sense. So it's about accountability. Like you you can't fudge the numbers. Exactly. Which which is yeah. good. So so what about carbon offsetting then? Right. Is there any room for that in this standard? There is, but it's it's not a it's not a free pass, right? right. The standard allows for for offsetting as kind of like a supplementary measure. Yeah. So you can't just buy your way to net zero. Right. The focus really is still on reducing emissions, you know, on site as much as possible. Reduction first, offsetting second. Exactly. Gotcha. 
that that makes a lot of sense. Our our article mentioned a few other um, you know kind of interesting tidbits about this standard and and particularly how it's actually going to be implemented. So they're going to do it in phases. Yeah. You're going to have this this pilot testing and then kind of come up with a final version um, down the line. Yeah, and it's a it's a really complex uh, you know undertaking, and I, I think they're yeah. you know it seems like they're taking this this measured approach. Which I, I think will ultimately be better. Yeah. You know, get it right the first time. Right. Like a dress rehearsal exactly. before the big, uh, you know, before opening night. Exactly. The article also mentions some um, limitations uh, to the standard, specifically that it doesn't cover everything just yeah. yet. What what did what did they mean by that? So for now, it's mainly applicable to um, you know, buildings in the UK. Huh. And it has... Um, you know, specific scope in terms of the types of buildings it addresses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want, you know, I don't want to downplay this at all. It's it's a huge step. Sure. But I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that this is this is a work in progress, you know. Right, right. Um, but there are already plans to kind of expand its reach, you know, geographically and end scope down the road. So potentially a, a global game changer, but starting with a, a really solid first step. Yeah. Okay. So so what does this all mean for the future of construction? Big picture. If this takes off, what what kind of impact are we are we talking about here? Well, and that's and that's the really exciting part. And it, it goes you know far beyond just the UK. If if this standard is as you know successful as we as we think it's going to be in the UK, it it could um, really spark similar uh, you know initiatives in in other countries. You know where we're already seeing a a global shift towards sustainability. You know, across the built environment, mm -hmm. and a standardized framework like this could could really accelerate that trend. Yeah, like a ripple effect. I I love that. Imagine like a world where where buildings are are designed and and constructed with net zero emissions in mind, like from the get go. That's just the norm. Exactly. Not not some you know like exception or anything. And and the the impact you know goes goes beyond just you know the the environment too. Okay. This this standard could have um some pretty big economic implications as well. Oh, interesting. Like, how so? Well, for one, you know, compliance with these standards, um, I, I think that could become a really key factor in, in real estate transactions down the line. Okay. So, you know, a net zero certification, uh, you know, that, that could increase a building's value, right? right. Or, or make it more attractive to, to potential buyers or renters. Interesting. So it becomes like a, a, a selling point, like a way for for a building to to stand out in the market. Exactly. <laughs> and it's it's not just the private sector either, right? Yeah. I mean, we could very well see this standard being like integrated into planning processes. Yeah. And even like you know building regulations. So it's it's possible that you know down the line, meeting these these net zero standards could actually become mandatory. For new construction projects. Wow. That that would be huge. Right. It would really, really level the playing field and, yeah. and encourage, you know, everyone involved to, to really prioritize sustainability right. from from day one. Exactly. Which I, I love that. And and don't and don't forget about, you know, existing buildings either. Right. Like, as as we mentioned earlier, this standard applies to those as well. Yeah. Which means we're gonna see, you know, this 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 growing demand for retrofits. Yeah. And and renovations that can really you know, improve energy efficiency right. and, and reduce those emissions. Because we can't just like, you know, demolish all the buildings that exist now and start from scratch, yeah. right? Right. We need to find a way to work with what we've got. Exactly. And make make the current infrastructure that we have more sustainable. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, this this standard, this provides, you know, that roadmap for doing that. You know, yeah. it, it really clearly sets targets and and it provides a framework for for actually measuring progress, which is which is crucial if, if we want to drive, you know, real meaningful change. Absolutely. So so we've covered the potential global impact. We've we've talked about the, um, you know, the economic implications. What about the legal side of things? I, I know that our our article mentioned how how this standard might actually start showing up in you know in legal documents yeah. like related to real estate and stuff yeah yeah that that's um i think a really interesting aspect of of all of this as as the standard starts to you know gain more traction i yeah. i think we can expect to see it um referenced a lot more in in legal agreements mm. you know things like leases um development contracts even financing kind of, agreements so so it, it becomes a contractual obligation mm. for for builders and and developers to to actually meet these these net zero standards exactly and, and for for tenants you know it, it could give them a lot more um 
you know, leverage to to negotiate for energy efficient spaces. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So it's it's really about like, you know, yeah. embedding these these sustainability principles into like the very fabric of, of the real estate industry. I like it. This this is all incredibly exciting. It, it it feels like we're on the cusp of a of a major transformation in in in, in, in the way that we design yeah. build. And even just like think about buildings. Oh yeah. No, I, I agree, I agree. This the standard has the potential to to be, you know, truly, truly transformative. And right. and not just for the UK, right? Right. Like for, for for the entire world. Which is really cool. Yeah. But but I, I think it's important to kind of like take a step back for a second and, and remember why this all matters in the first place. Like it's it's easy to get caught up in, you know, the technical technicalities of, of building standards and all this, but but this is about something much bigger. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is about, you know, yeah. tackling, you know, this this climate crisis head on yeah. and, and creating a more sustainable future, you know, for everyone. And mm -hmm. this this standard, you know, it, it, it's focused on, you know, reducing emissions from from the built environment. But but really, it represents, you know, this this significant step in the right direction. Yeah, like you said earlier, buildings make up a, a huge chunk of, of global emissions. So so addressing the sector is is absolutely essential if if we're if we're serious about meeting, you know, our climate goals. Hundred percent. And and it's not just about, you know, reducing our impact. It's it's also about creating these these like healthier, more more resilient and, and just like more livable spaces for everyone. Mm -hmm. I, right. You know, buildings that are that are designed with sustainability in mind, they mm -hmm. tend to be a lot more energy efficient. They often have better indoor air quality mm -hmm. and, and they're often located in 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 more walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. For sure. So so it's it's really a win win. Right. Absolutely. We, yeah. we reduce our environmental impact and we get to enjoy, you know, these healthier, more livable communities yeah. in, in the process. But but this kind of change doesn't happen overnight, does it? No. Of course not. You know, it's it's going to require a a collective effort from from governments, yeah. from businesses, individuals, everyone to to really make this vision a reality. Sure. But the, but the UK's you know net zero carbon building standard, it's it's a a really solid foundation to start with, and and it's it, its success could you know inspire other countries and other organizations to to kind of follow suit. I, I think so too. It's it's a it's an exciting time to be involved in this field. It it certainly is, yeah. yeah. Now I don't know about you, but I'm I'm feeling very inspired by all of this. It's it's so great to see these these really concrete steps being taken to to address you know this this pressing global challenge that we're facing. Me too, and and I, and I think it's important to remember, mm -hmm. you know, that this standard, as as ambitious as it is, it, it really is achievable. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we we have the technology, we have the resources, and and you know, increasingly we we have the willpower. To really make net zero buildings the the new normal. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Now, circling back to the standard itself, I I was particularly struck by um, its emphasis on on using you know real in use data for verification. Right. It's it's not enough to just you know talk the talk. You mm. you really gotta walk the walk and and prove that that your building is is performing as intended. Oh, I I completely agree. That's that's a, a crucial aspect of all this. Mm. You know, for for too long we've we've relied on these like theoretical models and and projections you know when mm. when we're trying to assess the sustainability of a building and and you know this standard with with its focus on you know actual performance data this is this is a much needed um corrective i guess right it, it really brings this this level of accountability and transparency that that's been sorely lacking yeah the proof is in the pudding as they say exactly or, or in this case the, the proof is in the the energy bills and the emissions data 100 percent. and and this this data-driven approach it it isn't just about you know verifying compliance right it's, right it's also about pinpointing areas for improvement exactly so so by by tracking you know real energy consumption and yeah. emissions you know building owners and and operators they they can like identify inefficiencies yeah. and actually implement solutions to 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 reduce their environmental footprint even further yeah Jeez. so so it's it's about continuous improvement it is it's not just like you know you you do it once and you're done right it's it's about always trying to to do better yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. so you're using data to like optimize building performance right and right. make it and make buildings as sustainable as possible exactly yeah i like that it's it's about like you know it's it's about um you know fostering this 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 culture of you know continuous improvement 
within within the built environment. I like it. And the and the great thing about this this data driven approach is that you know, it it really allows for for benchmarking and comparison. Okay. So you know, building owners they can they can see how their properties you know measure up against against mm-hmm. others in their sector, which is really cool. Yeah. And and that you know that can really drive drive innovation and mm-hmm. encourage the adoption of best practices. Absolutely. So it's all about creating this this like you know virtuous cycle of, yeah. of sustainability within the entire industry. Yeah. Okay, cool. Speaking of best practices, I, I'm curious to hear your take on this. You know, our article mentioned that this standard, it, it permits voluntary carbon offsetting, but but only to supplement on-site emissions reduction, not to replace it completely. So what are your what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, that's a that's a great question. Yeah. And and that's one that you know sparks a lot of debate in in sustainability circles. I, I bet. I, I feel like there are some pretty strong opinions on both sides of that issue. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, on the one hand, carbon offsetting can can be a really valuable tool for 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 neutralizing emissions that are, you know, uh, unav- uh, uh, unavoidable. Right. Right. Especially in the short term, you know, as as we're trying to transition to a a low carbon economy. Right. And, and if and if it's done correctly, you know, these these offsetting projects, they, they can really deliver some 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 real environmental and social benefits things like reforestation renewable energy development methane capture right those all sound like like really positive initiatives yeah so so what's the what's the downside what what are people concerned about so the the main concern with with offsetting is that sometimes it can be used as a way to kind of you know avoid making like yeah. significant changes to reduce emissions you know on site on site you know, it's it's kind of like it's it's kind of like trying to buy your way out of you know, guilt, instead of actually like you know changing your behavior. Uh, okay. Yeah. So so it's important to view carbon offsetting as as a a last resort, not like a get out of jail free card. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's why I think the the way that this UK standard approaches offsetting is is really sensible mm-hmm. because by allowing it as a supplement. Right. Right. But but not a replacement for these these on site reductions. Yeah. It, it encourages this this more kind of like balanced approach. Right. Right. Yeah. So it keeps the focus on making those those like you know real measurable reductions and emission from from the building itself. Exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. And it's and it's worth noting too that that the standard it it also includes like you know specific requirements for mm. the types of offsetting projects that can even be used. Okay. So the the carbon credits they have to come from from projects that have been independently verified okay and and that meet these really really rigorous standards so so that means that you know we we know that the the emissions reductions that are happening yeah they wouldn't have happened otherwise so so there's there's a lot of thought going into this right, right. To, to make sure that this this offsetting oh is is actually making a real difference yeah yeah okay cool so We've we've covered a lot of ground here. We've yeah. we've talked about the specifics of the UK's net zero carbon buildings standard. It's its potential global impact, the the economic and legal implications, mm-hmm. and and even you know kind of the the nuances of of carbon offsetting. Yeah. It's it's safe to say that that this topic has has a lot of layers to it. It it really does, yeah. Yeah, and and it's and it's definitely one that's that's only going to become more important in the years to come mm-hmm. as as we work to kind of you know decarbonize the world. 100%. So, so as we as we wrap up this this deep dive, yeah. what's what's the what's the one key takeaway that that you hope our listeners kind of you know walk away with today? Oh, that's that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think the the key takeaway here is that you know we're at this this really uh, pivotal moment, right? Right. This UK is met zero carbon buildings standard. You know, it's it's just one piece of of a much larger puzzle, of course, but. But it really does represent this this significant step forward. Yeah. You know, in, in this global effort to to decarbonize the, the built environment, it, it provides this, you know, this tangible framework for for action. Right? Yeah. A, a way to to measure progress. And and maybe maybe most importantly, a, a beacon of hope. Ooh, I like that. A beacon of hope. It's it's easy to like, you know, feel overwhelmed by by the the climate crisis, right, and and all the the challenges that that come with that, but but initiatives like this, they really show us that that progress is possible. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's it's not about you know waiting for for someone else to solve the problem for us. Yeah, each of us in our own way. You yeah, know, we can we can contribute to to a more sustainable future. Whether whether you're you know a, a homeowner or a renter. Mm-hmm. 
a yeah. builder, an architect, mm -hmm. or or just like you know someone who cares about the planet, right? Right. There are steps that that we can all take to to make a difference. Absolutely, and and staying informed like you're doing right now by listening to this deep dive. That that's a, a really crucial first step. One hundred percent. The the more we you yep. know. The more we understand these these mm -hmm. challenges and and the potential solutions out there, the the better equipped we'll be to to actually you know make make informed choices. Yeah, that that contribute to that more sustainable future. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now before we before we sign off here, I I do want to leave our listeners with with one final thought to to ponder. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how this this UK standard, you know, it it could. Um, you know, spark similar initiatives, you know, in other countries. But but what if what if we think even bigger than that? You know, what if this is this is just the beginning of, of a, a global movement to like completely rethink the way that we design, build and, and even just like inhabit our, our built environment? You know, what if it what if it sparks this this wave of innovation that results in buildings that aren't just net zero, but but actually regenerative, right? Buildings that that actually give back more than they take. Now, wouldn't that be something? Right. It's it's a it's a bold vision for sure, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's totally out of reach. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a goal worth striving for. And and with with that inspiring thought, we're going to wrap up this this deep dive into the world of net zero buildings. We we hope you found it informative, thought provoking, and, and maybe even a little bit hopeful. Here, as always, stay curious, stay engaged, and let's keep this conversation going.